Welcome to another practice question review video. Let's get right into it. A user wants to send a digitally signed message with the MD2 hashing algorithm. The user calculates the message digest and appends it at the end of the message without computing the 16 byte checksum. Which of the following is the most correct statement pertaining to this scenario? A. Collisions will more likely occur as the checksum generation didn't take place. The B, the computation of the checksum is an added security feature of MD2. C, without the checksum, hashing will not occur. D, the speed of the hashing process is significantly increased without the checksum. Which one is the correct answer? You can pause the video and just think about it before I give the answer. But trust me, you don't have to think that much about it and you don't have to spend that much time agonizing over it. Okay, the correct answer is A. MD2 is vulnerable to a birth birthday attack. Collisions will more likely occur as the checksum generation didn't take place. Okay, this is a fact. In the MD2 hashing digest, the plain text that is converted to a hash has an 182-bit value. Of these 128 bits, there is a 16-byte checksum added to the end. It has been found that if you don't add this padded 16-byte checksum at the end of the hash, the algorithm is vulnerable to a birthday attack, which is you know, predicting the collisions of uh, the same hash being generated from the same plain text. Bad. That's bad for cryptography. Now, do you really need to know this for the SysP exam? Most likely not. I haven't seen MD2 mentioned anywhere in the Sean Harris 7th edition. That's my reference for this video. The Sean Harris only talks about the MD4 algorithm, only begins with the MD4 algorithm, then goes on to MD5 and then SHA-1. I'm not sure about the Cybex though, but it probably doesn't have the MD2 algorithm mentioned anywhere in there either. If it does, just let me know. So why am I spending four hours out of my day to make this video? Why would I waste your time with a random question like this, this random cryptography question that you know seems like a waste? Why would I waste that hard-earned money you are spending on your subscription to this site? Because at a high level, the question is just not about whether you knew about the MD2 algorithm and the checksums or the hash values. It's so much more than that. Some folks might get immediately freaked out that they didn't know this or that they should study the cryptography chapter more or something like that. But that's not the point of this video at all. This question has nothing to do with your knowledge. If you got it wrong, doesn't matter. If you got it right, great. If you guessed, great. You're going to take a lot of practice questions before you take the exam. I usually recommend around 5,000. Not every question is going to prepare you or even be on the exam that's you know closely related in, in any way. When you get questions like this where you think it's just a waste of time or just testing your cryptography minutia, the best thing to do is just quiz yourself and examine the purpose of the question and where it leads you. It's like this. MD2 was found vulnerable. Okay, cool. So that's why MD4 exists. MD4 is definitely in your study guides and now you know uh, why it, it was created. What ca and what came before it, MD2. Even though MD2 isn't really mentioned in the Sean Harris study guide, you now know it exists because it is superseded by MD4. In, th in the same train of thought, so why do we have MD5? Because then you know that MD4 was most likely found vulnerable as well, which it was. Cool? Then you move on to SHA-1, the more prominent hashing algorithm today, which is more resistant to birthday attacks and collision. You may not need to know about MD2 for the exam, but you definitely have to know about SHA-1. But if you backtrack and ask why SHA-1 exists, you find yourself going all the way back to the original MD2. So in a way, you kind of do have to know about MD2, or it's actually forced upon you. If you study really hard and, and, you, and you research your concept externally using Google or YouTube or any other kind of source and take a deeper understanding and take a deeper stab at what you're studying, you start to realize these things, how everything kind of connects. Even though MD2 is not in your study guides, you now know about it because you studied SHA-1 and all its predecessors. Do you see what I'm saying here? You're now looking at the existence of SHA-1 at a high level. Instead of saying, oh man, I better memorize that SHA-1 has a 160-bit uh, hash instead of 128 bits and, and, and uses more mathematical functions, and oh, I better memorize that SHA has three variations like 256 bits, 384 bits, and 512 bits because the exam might ask me that. No, the SISP exam is not going to ask you that. It's not going to ask you how many variations of SHA there are or something direct like that. That's these practice questions that you see on the internet. 
What it's going to do is present you with a scenario question where you'll be expected to know why SHA exists, why MD4 isn't used, and why MD2 isn't used, and why we have hashing all together. Uh, this is what is meant by a high level exam. That's what a SysP is, a high level exam. And that's all this video is about. I don't care if you knew the answer, if you got it right or wrong, that's not the point. Some things I hope you take away from this video is the difference between hashing and encryption, how birthday attacks work, and the purpose of hashing versus encryption. This stuff you do have to know. Okay, quick practice question review videos like this, thinking beyond the question and beyond the correct answer and thinking why not only why the subject of hashing exists and why this very question was even created, that's what it's trying to teach us. That's what practice questions are there for. It's not whether to test whether you got it right or wrong, it's to see if you can think at a high level why even the question itself exists or why it's presented when you're studying for the CSP exam. You're going to take a lot of practice questions, some of them won't make sense, and some of the topics you read you'll never ever see on the exam. And it goes both ways. There's some topics on the exam that you'll never ever see in your practice questions or your study guides ever. That's just the secrets of the CSP exam. Okay, that's all this video was. Thanks for watching.